Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, I'm here to talk about multi-threaded Postgres. Uh, I think we have a few more empty seats. If you just squeeze in, we can have everyone sit down. This is so shocking that I want people to sit down. Um, so why now? Why is the you know why did this suddenly come up? Uh, this idea of multi-threading after all these years. Postgres has always had the like very classic 1990s multi-process architecture. Uh, so the reason I brought this up now, uh, or last summer, is that I was having some hallway, very casual hallway uh, conversations in PGCon in Ottawa. There was some other, uh, Andres was there, and uh, there were others, I don't remember. The, but were, like, we had a big circle of people standing and kind of laughing at each other how silly it is that we're doing stuff like uh, you know, dynamic shared memory and how hard it is to share data in Postgres because of the multiprocess architecture and how much simpler all of these things would be if we had multi multi-threaded architecture. And it was like, I was reading the room or hallway and, and thinking like someone actually needs to like say this out loud that we would like to have a multi-threaded architecture because clearly we're all suffering because we don't. Uh, so I, I followed up on this and, and wrote an email to hackers uh, to, you know, proposing let's, let's make Postgres multi-threaded if we all clearly would, would like to do that so much and the, the world would be so much better place if we had that. Uh, I mean, there was a long discussion. I, that was expected. I knew that would, they would, they would, people have emotions on, on big architectural changes like this. Uh, but there was no real big thing that we can't do or why, why, why we would need to do it now, except that a lot of time has passed since Postgres was uh, created uh, originally. And uh, a lot of other big projects have kind of made the transition over the years for various reasons. Uh, so why not Postgres? Uh, the current status is, well, there is no patch. Like, I haven't written a patch to do this. Uh, there is a very preliminary refactoring thing I, I opened to, to the latest commit fest for, like, I created those patches because of I started to look at multi-threading. But, like, this is a marathon project. This is a long, long project. And if this is a marathon, the patch that's out there, that's like putting on, on your code so that you can walk to the shoe store to buy the shoes that you will use to run the marathon, like it's at that stage. Uh, so so it, I, I did a little bit of poking around. There's a thread on, on my GitHub page. I mean, it doesn't, I mean, don't look at it. It doesn't do multi-threading. What it is, is it's like going through all of the global variables that we have and kind of annotating them what they are, because that's going to be one of the first steps we will need to do with multi-threading. Uh, and I will talk more about that. But there is no patch. Uh, I might work on this. I might not work on this. I'm not promising anything. Uh, I'm not promising anything mainly because I, like, I don't want to discourage any of you guys to, to work on this. Uh, that's the last thing I want to do is kind of block this, this line of work from others. Uh, but I think this would make sense, and I think a lot of other people agree. Not everyone agrees. That's fine. But I'm going to try to convince you why this is a good idea. So a little bit of background. So Postgres has this multi-process architecture. Uh, when you connect to Postgres, the Postmaster accepts the connection. It launches a, for, a process, and the process is connected to a piece of shared memory. And, uh, and there is a lot of stuff in the shared memory. Well, Postgres, there's, there's a lot of stuff that is per, like backend private, private to the process. Uh, relation caches, all kinds of state that is uh, local to that process, which is handling the connection. But there's also a lot of shared, shared memory, a lot of shared state between. I mean, it's a database system. The processing needs to communicate with each other, and they're very tightly integrated. So just to give you an, an idea of what is in the shared memory at the moment, uh, I don't know if this is too small to read, but there's a lot of stuff. Uh, all of these are kind of shared memory data structures that are fixed size, like each one of these lines represents a piece of shared memory that has a fixed size, and you can't change that size after Postgres has started up. Uh, some of them are very simple. They just contain a few variables that need to be shared across all of the processes. Some of them are more complicated, like shared buffers, which is you know, where most of the memory goes. Uh, but all of them are kind of the same. And, and there's more. Like, <laughs> uh, and at the end, you can see Include additional requested shared memory for preload libraries so that there is a little bit of leeway for uh, stuff that you add in shared preload libraries. 
Uh, oh, and there's more. There's the you know dynamic shared memory because we found that it's actually pretty awkward if you can't resize the shared memory block. So we invented a mechanism called dynamic shared memory, uh, which allows you to allocate new big blocks of shared memory and and uh, and resize that. But it's it's more awkward to work with. But we use it for stuff like parallel sorting, uh, hash table for parallel hash joins, uh, sharing record type cache. The first three of those are all actually related to parallel query. So parallel query was one of the first ones that would have benefited a lot from uh, from multi-threading, but we didn't have it at the moment. And uh, the developers of uh, of the parallel query feature didn't want to go there with multi-threading because it would have been like having to run two marathons <laughs> after each other. So so they decided to go this way and, and do the dynamic shared memory stuff instead. But there's like a lot of lot of stuff like that. In a multi-threaded architecture, it kind of looks the same, except that everything runs in a single process and a single address space. And the big difference is that these, all of these data structures, they don't, need to be, uh, they don't need to be fixed size. You can do more flexible stuff. You can just uh, allocate a piece of memory and pass it a pointer to it to a different thread, uh, which is a lot more convenient for, for developers who, who need to work with this stuff. Uh, so again, the big difference is that in a multiprocess architecture, you have one process, one address space. In a uh, sorry, separate address space for each process, uh, and you have to be explicit when you want to share something. If you want to share something, you need to put it in a. You need to allocate pre-allocate space for it in shared memory, and you need to store it there. You can't have it anywhere else. Uh, whereas in a uh, in a threaded architecture, you have just one address space and you can share pass pointers between the threads. Uh, and everything is, kind of sh everything is shared by default, or, or any thread can access any piece of data if they want to. If, they, if, if you don't do the locking right, you will get crashes and so forth, but that's no different from multiprocessing. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's the basic, basic difference. Uh, so why would we do this? Like, well, what are the benefits? Well, one immediate benefit I think we would get is a little bit of extra performance if you have a CPU heavy workload. Like uh, having a lot of processes is, uh, makes the context switching more expensive in, in the kernel. Uh, so you, with multi-threaded, you get fewer TLB misses in the CPU and fewer uh, pages. But really, I think m what I care about most is like I don't I don't care about this stuff so much. I haven't done any measurements. Uh, but this is stuff I actually care about. So this is all about making the life of developers like me working on Postgres easier to do stuff like this. Uh, so there's a lot of, like all of these things are, you could find workarounds. So like we could do all of these things if we, if we want to in a multiprocess architecture as well. But it's just a lot more code. Like it's a lot more code if you need to do pre-allocate space for each of these things and uh, you can't resize them easily, or if you need to resize them, you need to go with the dynamic shared memory, which is more complicated to work with. You can't just pass pointers. Uh, but these things are easier in a, in a multi-threaded architecture, basically. So, so kind of my, my motivation for multi-threaded is the long-term benefit of all of the things that all of these things that become easier to do uh, in that architecture if you don't need to work explicitly with shared memory. Uh, so one upshot of this is that I don't think we will actually get many of these benefits or any of these benefits until we rip out and remove the multiprocess uh, code we have today. Uh, so that kind of implies that we want to keep the transition period as short as possible. Because as long as we still need to support multiprocesses, we can't really do this. We don't get the benefits. You kind of pay the price of both models, but not getting the benefits. But, but I will come back to that. So in that thread, uh, people had objections, which is understandable. Uh, I'm going to address the first three uh, first. So first of all, the first objection was like, yeah, but that's a lot of work. Like, it's not worth the effort. Why are you spending your time on that? Uh, well, yeah, that, it might, that might be true. Uh, if that's true, then this just won't happen. Like, no one is going to finish this project. Uh, but also, it's kind of a wrong question to ask in an open source project. Like, if people want to work on X, you don't, you know, if someone wants to do parallel query, you don't go to them and say, 
well, I don't think you should spend your time on that. You should, you know, do column story instead. Like, that's not how it works. People, people in an open source project decide to, to spend their time on the projects they want to work on, and they, they feel valuable. Uh, so in a way, that's a wrong question to ask. Like, it, it, people might be right, it's not worth the effort, but, but who are you to say to someone? Second objection is that it's just too much incompatibility. Like, you know, if this would be not just the work that someone working on these patches will have to spend, but it will actually impose a lot of maintenance overhead and work to all everyone else, and that's not fair. Uh, so that, that, that's a fair objection. Uh, we don't want to have a kind of Python 2 versus Python 3 uh, situation where, you know, you have a bunch of features that work with threads, but they don't work with processes or vice versa. Uh, Postgres has always been really good at you know, all of the features work together, uh, and you can combine them. And, and I, I don't want to fragment uh, Postgres into two versions that are incompatible. Uh, I think that's a real risk. Uh, so if we're going to go through with this, the transition needs to be smooth, where like you don't, you don't know this, that we, we just change the architecture underneath. Uh, that's the goal uh, for two users. Uh, but again, this is kind of, if we don't accomplish this, then this won't happen, like the patches won't get accepted. So there's no need to get too emotional about this. Uh, third objection is, uh, uh, Tom Lane raised this very early in the thread, which is uh, it will be a disaster and there will be a lot of bugs that are hard to debug. Well, I hope not. Like, I mean, this isn't rocket science. Other people have done multi-threaded uh, projects. Other big projects have gone through this transition. Yeah, I'm sure there will be bugs, uh, like with any other big projects, there will be bugs, uh, but then we'll fix them. Uh, and of course, we will need some kind of beta period or like market as experimental for a release or two, also so that extensions and the whole ecosystem can catch up. But, uh, but yeah, this is a... If this turns out to be a disaster, then we, again, we won't do it. It's that simple, like no need to get emotional about it. Uh, there is a fourth objection, which I, I think is more serious in a way. Like all of these three ones are, the first ones are, uh, have to do with the fact that it's not more worth making the migration from what we have today. Like you, we don't want to change the status quo because it's too much work or it's too destabilizing or it will introduce a lot of bugs. But the fourth one is actually an, a, an argument like the isolation is actually an argument for, like, even if you were writing Postgres from scratch today, this argument would hold. Uh, like, it is better in some way, objectively speaking. Uh, so, like, there is some precedence for this. Like, Chrome uh, introduced the architecture, like, introduced multi-process architecture for isolation purposes, so that if one tab crashes, you only have to shut down that tab and not the whole browser, which was a great improvement back in the day. Uh, I think that's fair. Uh, in practice, I, I don't think that's too significant in Postgres. Uh, we have some code in, in Postmaster and elsewhere, like if one process crashes, we can uh, close that process and keep the other ones running, but we don't actually do that. We, if one of the processes crashes unexpectedly in Postgres, the Postmaster will immediately kill all the other processes too, because it's just not safe. Uh, if you remember the list of all the shared memory data structures we have, if a process crashes, it might, be, might have corrupted any of those, and we don't really know if it's safe to continue. So we're not really getting that much isolation in Postgres from the multiple processes anyway. If any one of them crashes, we already have to shut down the whole server and a restart. So I mean, is it really buying you anything? Not really. I don't think so. Uh, the, there is the last argument that multiple processes can be easier to work with. Like you can attach a debugger to a single process or run perf uh, to do profiling on a single process, uh, S-trace, top, like there's a lot of tools that work with processes. Mm. I think that's also just a switching pain, like a lot of those tools can also work with threads. Uh, I, I'm not too familiar with them because I haven't really had to with a Postgres developer, but uh, people, people run debuggers on multi-threaded programs all the time. It's not anything new and it's, uh, it can be even better in many ways. You can stop all of the threads in a process easily. Can't do that easily when you have to attach a debugger to multiple processes and stuff like that. Uh, so that's, again, just uh, something that developers will have to get used to if we, if we make this change. Uh, but it's not really 
processes are not better uh, intrinsically uh, in that. So there's, there's one objection that I, I am actually a little bit worried about, which is memory leaks. Uh, one nice thing about multiprocess is that if you have a memory leak uh, in that process, uh, when, you, when you terminate that process, like if the connection, when you close the connection, all that memory gets released. Uh, that we don't get with multithreading. Like if you have one thread that's leaking memory, it will just keep growing, and even if you terminate the connection, it won't go away. Uh, so that's a bit scary. Uh, but I think that will also be okay. I'm optimistic. Like we don't leak resources that often in Postgres. We already do all of the allocations in what we call memory contexts. So when the thread terminates, we just destroy the top memory context and all of the memory goes away and, and everything is rosy. Uh, same with any other resources. We have resource owners to, to track them and, and they're pretty good at preventing leaks. We did have one case until recently with LLVM, like if you do JIT compilation with LLVM, until I think a month ago or something, I think Daniel committed the, the, the fix for that, uh, we used to have a session lifetime leak where if you, you would just, memory usage would slowly grow until you terminate the connection. But that was also clo like that was fixed. Um, so those are the, the basic objections that were raised on the hacker's thread and, and then that I heard from others. Uh, kind of all of the objections kind of fall into one of those categories and uh, yeah. So there's one more argument in favor of multiprocessing, which is uh, like having multiprocessor architecture kind of forces you to think very hard, what do you share between the, st the, the processes? Like, because it's so painful to do. Like, it's very painful if you need to pre-allocate the space for everything and, uh, and you really need to like, make an explicit decision that, okay, this piece of memory is shared and, and I'm gonna store this struct or this hash table in that shared memory. So it forces you to think really hard what needs to be shared between uh, processes and what, what doesn't need to be shared. Uh, Multithreading kind of turns that around, as in, you know, everything is running in the same address space, and if, you're, if you don't think about this, if you're not disciplined, you can easily just willy-nilly, you know, pass memory between threads and lose track of which thread owns uh, which piece of memory. Uh, but there are, again, there are ways of around this. You can, you know, have naming conventions. Uh, we already have the memory contexts. I would imagine that they would still be per thread or per connection. Uh, so, you know, each piece of memory would still have an owner uh, unless you explicitly, again, share it. So I don't think this is too bad. Uh, I think the benefit of actually being able to do those things, like sharing data structures, uh, outweighs the, 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 the downsides. So there has been some previous attempts, uh, attempts at this. Uh, there wasn't a very early Windows port. I didn't find this in the hackers, but I've heard that one of the early Windows ports of Postgres was actually based on multi-threading, so they, they kind of did that work. Uh, but I, I, I didn't find that. If anyone has a link to that, I would be interested to see. Uh, so that might have, must have been around 7, version 7.4 or 8.0 or something that, that time. Uh, the second one is uh, interesting. That was something that a colleague of mine pointed me to, and it was not mentioned on the hacker's thread, actually, but uh, there was a project in CMU uh, to use, I don't know what exactly it was actually, but it was like trying to use Postgres with Peloton, which is uh, some kind of a database backend. Uh, somehow merged those two, I, two, I don't know what it exactly was. But if you follow the link, there is actually a good description of uh, what they had to do, or they, I don't think they actually did it, but they did some investigation on what it would it take to make Postgres multi-threaded, because that would have helped their project. So there's a good description of, okay, we need to go through all of the global variables, turn them into thread local variables, and there's a few other things that they like identified, um, and it's a good write-up of all those things. Uh, the third one is a, it's a, it's a patch from Konstantin Knitsnik, uh, who worked for Postgres Pro, now works for Neon, actually, uh, but he worked for Postgres Pro at the time, and uh, he wrote a patch to do this, basically. Uh, it was not production ready, but it, it was enough to do some performance testing. He went through the same steps, turn all of the global variables into thread local variables and, and fixed a few other things. 
Uh, but, it, but like there is a pattern here. Everyone who starts this project will find that we use a lot of global variables, we need to change them, and there's a few other modules we need to rewrite. Uh, so th that is basically what the, this project will look like when someone will take it. So there are, there are other projects that have made the switch. I just want to list a few. I don't know too much details about this, but uh, I know Apache 2 has uh, multiprocessing modules. You it can do fork forking processes or it can do threads. I think it can do any combination of those two, and, uh, and there's an event library that they use for, to handle a lot of idle connections, so it's like a hybrid approach. I don't want to do this kind of hybrid approach in Postgres, because I, uh, many of the, I said earlier, like many of the benefits, we, we really don't get the benefits of the easier model as long as we still have the support processes. So I think we'll, we'll, we will want to do the switch and not look back. Um, but Apache did that. Uh, they, I think what's unique in uh, Apache HTTP server is that they have a long list of modules like uh, written in Perl, Python, whatever, to do various things. And uh, so they had a similar kind of ecosystem problem that Postgres does. Like Postgres also has a lot of extensions and they will need to be uh, also multi-thread safe in order to work in, in, in multi-threaded architecture. So there is some precedence there. They made the switch. Don't know, you know, I've, I haven't spoken to the Apache developers about how, what they feel about it like 20 years later. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so there is some precedence for, for making the switch. Uh, Oracle also supports threads and processes for better or worse. I don't know Oracle. I don't know what's the recommended way. I think they added uh, the threading support for Windows, but they also support it on Linux now. Um, they seem to be happy with supporting both versions, but I think they support a lot of options. And again, I don't think Postgres will get the benefits unless we, uh, unless we like, just make the switch. Uh, Firebird also uh, make, made this switch some time ago. I don't know how it's worked for them, but they haven't. I mean, it's clearly possible in a database, open source database project, too, because they did it. So. So what is involved? So what does it actually look like if we're going to make this switch? Uh, well, first of all, we need to launch these threads instead of processes. That much is clear. Like instead of forking a process, you, you fork a thread. Uh, I mentioned the global variables uh, many times. So that's, uh, that's one of the things we will need to do. So we have a lot of session local state in Postgres. There's, like, there's a ton of these. I think, I think I counted the global variables. I think there's like 2,000 of them. Uh, in Postgres code. A uh, lot of them are GUX, like settings that you set in the config file or such. Uh, that's, that's like one big chunk of them. Uh, but there's plenty of others. There's a lot of session local caches. There's a lot of session, uh, like back in private uh, data structures initialized. There's a lot of per transaction state that gets cleared at the end of each transaction. There's a lot of, a lot of different state with different lifetimes uh, stored in global variables. Uh, I mean, that's fine in the multiprocess architecture, that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that. I, a, lot of, a lot of people have an aversion to global variables, but I mean, there, is, there isn't anything inherently wrong with them. Uh, but all of these global variables that currently represent session local state, the specific to the, the uh, one connection, will we'll need to convert them to be thread local variables. Um, I think that's the, that's the gist of it. Or the other model is that we gather all of those, that different state into one large struct, which is like, this is the session, this is all of the state uh, that belongs to one session, and, and then we pass that around as a track local variable or something. But it's kind of the same thing. I don't think there's any big difference there. Uh, but, but the bottom line is that we will need to go through all of these global variables and, and mark them as session local. So this is what I have in mind. I think we'll, we'll need to annotate all of the global variables to say, okay, this is a session local variable, or this can stay as a global variable, like it is truly uh, something that uh, doesn't change, like every, every thread, it's okay for every thread to access the same variable. Uh, we have a few like lookup tables and stuff that we initialize at the back in the uh, startup like that. Uh, but we'll, I think we'll need to go through each one of them and annotate like which, which kind of variable is this actually. Uh, so that's a lot of work, uh, but it's, it's work that we need to do once and then we're done with it. Uh, we will uh, need to build some kind of static analysis tool or something to catch these cases. 
And, and that kind of brings me actually to the third, third problem, which is extensions. Um, so what are we going to do with extensions? Like even if we go through all of this work for Postgres, there's still going to be like a thousand extensions out there that would kind of need to do the same amount of work to make the switch. Um, and, but the extensions will also have a lifetime of their own, like they're released on their own schedule, not together with Postgres. So how are we going to manage this? Well, I think we will need to add a flags uh, to the control file of an extension. Uh, like there's, there's three, three options, like an extension can, uh, like it might not work with threads, so it needs to be marked as, you know, it only works with processes. That's the default, like that's what we have today. None of the extensions work with uh, threads, on, you know, unless accidentally they might, but. Uh, so that's, that, that, that would be the kind of default if you don't change anything. Uh, or you can mark an extension as, okay, I know this works with threads, uh, so you set the flag in the control file to indicate that. Uh, so, or, uh, or, or like that's the, but the, and the third option is that it works in either, like both models, which is, uh, which is nice for the transition period. Uh, but I think soon we will also start to see extensions that actually require the threaded model because it, it is easier for extensions too to then share data between connections. And there's a lot of extensions that also struggle with the sh shared memory and fixed size shared memory chunks. And it's, it's even actually even more painful in extensions because you have to put your library to shared, uh, add it to the shared preload libraries if it uses any shared memory and, and stuff like that. Uh, that goes away with the threaded model uh, and it becomes easier. But uh, in order to support all of the extension authors, like how does, you know, if I wrote an extension for my own integer type or whatever, how do I know if it's thread safe? Uh, so I think we will need to do some kind of static analysis of all of the global variables in the extensions too and kind of flag the potential problems uh, to make this transition easier. It's not going to catch everything, but it will catch like the 90% of the cases. So kind of if you look at all of the session local state, I think we will need to do this for Postgres, but actually what we need to do is to first write the tools to, do, to like find all of the global variables that you need to mark, and then you can use the same tool on extensions too. Like extensions or authors can, can do that as well. So once we've done that, there's a little bit of work left. So there are a few modules in Postgres or subsystems that we will need to write, like rewrite for the threaded model, or at least modify them, you know, with a bunch of uh, if statements, you know, which model are you in. One is the, like, virtual file descriptors, so uh, Postgres has, its backend process keeps track of the file descriptors you have open, like, which files do you have open? Um, and uh, once we switch to, uh, to a single process and multiple threads, that needs to be, uh, like, refactored to, uh, you know, we need to add, add locking there or something to that so that it works uh, because uh, it's just a single process. It needs to be per process. Uh, that's not a lot of work. I think that's uh, like a few days of work to, to make that work. But there's a few others. There's uh, inter-process signals. Like we use signals between processes for a few things. Like if you change the config file, we send SIGHUB to all of the, the processes to make them react. Or if, uh, you know, there needs to, some of the caches needs to be invalidated, we send signals to, between processes. Uh, you can't really send signals between threads, or maybe you can, I'm not entirely sure. I think there's just stuff for that. But most likely, I think we would want to change these to not use like Unix signals, but something else, uh, like pthread something, something, I'm not sure what exactly. But I think that's, that's one subsystem we'll, we'll need to rewrite, and it will, it will work differently with threads and, and processes, and there will be some if statements to choose. Uh, one interesting case is the a restart on crash. So when Postgres crashes, if one of the days, or today, if one of the processes crashes, uh, the Postmaster process will notice that. It will see that, oh, this, this child process died uh, unexpectedly, and it will kill all the other processes, wait for them to die as well, and then restart uh, the system from, uh, from, start, uh, from, from that. Uh, that's not really safe if we if you just switch to a multi-process, uh, multi-threaded architecture, because currently the postmaster process is very independent. Like it doesn't modify the shared memory, shared state, in, except in some very limited ways. Like it, the only purpose of it really is to accept the connections, 
and watch for the other processes to die and make sure that they get restarted cleanly. So I think for, the, for that, I think we'll need to like still have one extra process, which is the postmaster, to, to kind of uh, monitor the, uh, the process that's actually doing all of the work. Um, so that, that needs to be written. So there will be a transition period. Like the first version will be buggy. Uh, extensions will need to catch up. My thinking is that uh, I think we'll need to have a mode where it's a guck you can set in the Postgres config file, like uh, threads or processes, uh, simple as that. And, uh, and you can set it if you're brave. Uh, and then after a few years, we'll deprecate the old model. And then if you're brave, you will stick to the old model, but everyone will be using threads. And finally, we'll, we'll say, OK, this is stable enough. We can kill the old model and um, switch the threads all together. Remove all of the, the code we have to support the multiprocess mode. Because I think the goal has to be to get rid of the multiprocess model. If we end up in a situation where we have both, I think that's the worst case scenario. Like I really don't want to deal with the complexities of both shared memory in multiple processes, and, but also multi-threading. Like that's bad. So I think we need to keep this transition period as short as possible. Uh, or, or if we can't get to that, I don't think this, this is worthwhile, really, because then we, we won't get the benefits. But once we've done all of this stuff, like now we are in the brave new multi-traded world, like what can we do now? Like we've gotten rid of all the multi-process stuff. Now we can start to do stuff like, uh, you know, we can the parallel worker stuff becomes a lot easier. It becomes a lot easier to launch extra threads to, to, to do parallel query. Uh, we can make each connection a lot more lightweight by sharing the rel cache, catalog caches, shared plan cache. All of those things become easier. Like They won't automatically fall out of this, this conversion, but it becomes possible to implement these features. Uh, so though each one of these will be another like long project or another marathon to, for someone to do, but it, at least it becomes possible and feasible. Um, and all of these are kind of going in the direction where the, the connection becomes a lot more lightweight. It will, it will be faster to connect to Postgres. Uh, and you can have more connections. Like I think the need for having a connection pool uh, will probably not go away, but it will, like a lot fewer people will need to worry about uh, running PG Barnes or something because Postgres itself can just handle a lot more connections because uh, each one will be more lightweight. Uh, so, so there's a lot of benefits like that that we'll kind of we'll, we'll get in the long run from this. So, it's kind of the model I'm, I'm, I've been envisioning so far is the model where we still launch a thread for each incoming connection, and that thread handles that connection, like just replace process with a thread. Uh, that's not the only way to do this, though. Like, there's a lot of a lot of other stuff we could do after we switch. Uh, you could imagine having a thread pool and some kind of queuing mechanism, so you could have like a million incoming connections and a thread pool of 30 threads to handle them, and that way you could have a lot of, lot of idle connections uh, without, without having uh, so much penalty from each one and some kind of queuing system. Uh, I think for that we would probably need to have like a session state as a separate variable or something. But like that again, that's like a follow-up project we might or might not do in the future. Uh, I have a question. Yes. You didn't specifically mention this, so I ask: um, Is it the case that you might want to do that because, in some sense, Postgres knows better than the operating system how to schedule things? So that might be true. The Postgres might not know better than the operating system. I don't, like, no, I don't what I'm suggesting is it would. Yeah, I, I... Of course, it has every insight into what... So I, I think I'm actually... Like, thread pools, yeah, maybe. Uh, actually, I think the thread per core is, is, is more like that. So there's right, a... Right, that's what I was asking about. Yeah. So yeah. The, the, this is actually, like, kind of fashionable now. Like, SillaDB is making a big deal about their... Thread per core, shard per core, I think they're calling it. But like there are models like that where you actually SQL you, Server. Yeah. Okay, I didn't know I didn't know about SQL Server. But uh, like there are other models like that where you don't have a thread per connection, but you have a thread per, you know, a shard of data or a thread per you know some other 
uh, entity, and, and that, that can have some benefits, like you can have even more cache locality. Like if each thread is working on a specific piece of data, that piece of data will stay in that uh, like CPU's cache. So there's, there's benefits like that. I think those things will are kind of interesting from an academic point of view, but again, like I think that will be like the running the third marathon after doing <laughs> all of these other things. Uh, so yeah, maybe we'll get there, there in the future, but that, that's a long way uh, uh, ahead. And if we don't get there, that's fine. Like this, this is still worthwhile for all of the other benefits. Uh, Async execution is another one I, I added here. Like it's not directly re related to threads, really. Like we could do more async execution even without threads. So what that means is like uh, if you're a JavaScript developer or Python or Rust developer, you know async. Uh, like you, you can have async functions that return a future and then you can pull that and, and stuff like that. So that would allow us to do more stuff with uh, async IO, for example, or uh, you know some, that becomes handy if you have a case where you can launch a lot of actions or a lot of uh, processing you need to do, and then as the results arrive, you process them and you launch more work. So we did a little bit of this with the foreign data wrappers already. Like we already have that kind of async model with foreign data wrappers. You can have, like you can, if you're doing a, I forget where we use it, I think it's if you do a union of partitions or, or, or over foreign data wrappers, what Postgres can already do is to send the query to all of the foreign databases and then pull and process the results as they come in. Uh, so we added some ad hoc stuff just for that case, but it's a, it's a generic problem. Uh, or like, a, like there are other programming languages and other systems that do that and have like a, you know, async functions or uh, like coroutines and stuff like that to do that. Uh, it's not really related to threads. We could do those in processes as well. But I wanted to bring it up because uh, people have asked me about that. Like, what about this stuff? I think it's valuable, uh, but it's kind of a separate discussion. Uh, so maybe maybe time for another top talk on that. So in short, this is the I'm almost at the end. Uh, like, this is the last slide I have. This is kind of the short to-do list. So okay, like okay, what, what are the next steps that we need to do? I mentioned the global variables a few times. I think we need to annotate them. Uh, that might make sense anyway. Like I think it would be actually nice to have some kind of a you know annotation on each of the global variables. Like is this a session guck or is this a postmaster guck that doesn't change after startup, or is this a is this a static lookup table that is could be a const except compiler doesn't allow that, or or is this a transaction you know, lifetime variable that gets zeroed at the end of transaction. We have a lot of like, different categories of variables like that, and it would actually be kind of nice to annotate them, and maybe we could have some kind of assertions on them, uh, you know, even without threading, but, but it definitely needed with threading. Uh, I mentioned the extensions. Like, we could already start to add stuff to the control file, although you know, before we do the rest of the work, I'm not sure what the point would be, but we could. Uh, there needs to be a transition period. One interesting case is the third one, and I think that's actually the oh, fourth one, the PIDs in, in some user-facing API. So we have a few functions that actually take a process ID as an argument, and also the, like, we have a view PG stat activity that shows the process ID, uh, and actually in the protocol we also have the query cancel, like if you hit control C in PSQL, um, that protocol message includes the process ID, which uh, you know, we'll, need to re we'll need to replace it with some other identifier, like a connection ID or thread ID or something. Uh, but that's the kind of work we need to do. Uh, I think that would probably make sense to change anyway. Like I think it would make sense to have a, like a connection ID separate from the process ID in Postgres anyway. Or maybe it would just be like one-to-one mapping. I'm, I'm not sure what exactly to do there. But I, I think that would be an independent good uh, refactoring to do. Uh, I mentioned the signaling between backend processes, but also uh, maybe we'll need a replacement. Like currently, you can send SIG hop uh, manually on the Unix command line uh, to a ba one backend process, and it will reload the config file. I don't know if that's a very sensible thing to do to reload the config file just for one backend process. Uh, I think people will find that 
confusing if they do that, but it's possible. So uh, I think one question is like, do we need to write some kind of a helper tool for people to continue to do that? Like instead of sending a, a signal to a process, send a signal to a, the thread that's handling a connection or some kind of other, other signaling mechanism. Uh, then there's library functions. Uh, I mentioned set locale, use locale. That's one example we use. We use a few uh, library functions, uh, like in the C library or other libraries that are just not thread safe. Like they they have global variables behind those functions. So, uh, but all of them really have thread, you know, per thread or thread safe variants because you know other projects have been using thread for a long time. So all of that has. Uh, like ecosystem problems have been solved, we're just not using those thread safe APIs. So we'll, we will need to switch. Um, the last one is interesting. I think Python, it's not possible to have more than one Python interpreter in a process today. So Python is kind of single process uh, architecture as well, which is a problem for PL Python, of course. But I, I heard that recently that there is uh, some kind of project going on in Python as well to change that and actually make this possible. Uh, but we might have a dependency there where you need a very modern, ver like new version of Python uh, to use threads. Uh, I'm not sure yet. I haven't investigated that. Um, we might have similar problems with other languages, actually, like PL Java or, or, or stuff. Uh, but we'll kind of have to do the same thing, like switch to thread safe variants of those or uh, I know there is a project called PL Container, which launches like uh, launches uh, PL functions in, in containers, and, and then we can kind of fake the one process model for those. But that's kind of expensive, and uh, I'm, I hope we don't need to do that. But if we do, that's like an escape hatch for those extensions. Um, that's all I had. Do you want to add anything to my to-do list? <laughs> Am I missing something? <laughs> so is this going to be done uh, this month in December, or it's going to take you <laughs> <laughs> into January? or uh... December or January, I don't know which year. That's <laughs> I mean, because I, you know, I agree with a lot of the things you said in the presentation, both about the nature of the objections and where benefits are and stuff like that. But it, it, it's just a, it's a big lift to get it, especially over that initial hump where we start to get annotations in core and we start to get, you know, some pieces of infrastructure in place. And I guess I'm just sort of wondering, like, is this something you're experimenting with, or you think it's going to start to happen? Or? I, I'm, not ex I mean, I'm not spending any real efforts into this, but I think the way to finish a project like this is to start it first. So uh, we need to start somewhere, and kind of the first step is, has already been made. Like, I started the trade on hackers. Let's do this. Uh, that's the first step. Uh, the next step is going to be these individual pieces here, which makes sense anyway. Like the, you know, we know the query cancellation protocol is horrible. We need to, sh we should, you know, it makes sense to change it anyway. Uh, I said about the uh, annotating the global variables. I think a lot of that makes sense anyway. So let's start with those things. And uh, after we pick enough of these things individually, uh, that makes sense anyway, it will be a lot easier to make the final push of uh, getting over the, uh, like writing the final actual path, like drawing the rest of the owl. Uh, to actually uh, go over the hump. Yes, next question. Uh, yeah, so the question is about uh, when backend crashes, you then have the risk of, of course, corrupting the shared memory. But if a threat crashes, you can technically corrupt all of the memory of the process, including, well, the stuff that normally doesn't get corrupted in, co in Postgres. Yeah. What is, in your opinion, the biggest concern here? That Thank is you. a true point. I don't think it's very significant in practice. Like, as I said, like, most of the interesting stuff in Postgres is in the shared memory. And if any process crashes, we have to kill all the processes anyway. Like, it, there isn't really that much difference in practice. Yeah, I can see in, in abstract that's true, but like, would you trust your data if one of, the, if one of your backend processes crashes, the sec faults, and you don't know what happened, would you trust for the rest of the system to run, continue running? Like, no, you have to kill it all anyway. Uh, the, the only argument there would be that is it more likely that you would get silent cra like corruption of memory that you wouldn't cause a crash 
in threaded model, but in process model, it would cause a crash. I mean, I suppose it's possible, but I, I don't really see that now. Uh, what about connection cleanup when a connection terminates? Is that currently under control in terms of resources? Uh, I think it's pretty well. Uh, memory is allocated in memory contexts, so we can drop the top memory context and zap all of that goes away. Other resources, yeah, we use resource owners to track them. If we would have leaks there, I think we would already have a problem. Uh, I don't, I don't think that's a serious. Problem like I, we might have bugs there in the first version, but we'll we'll get, we'll fix them. Uh, right now we have the multi-process uh, based worker processing for parallel query. Um, what is the consideration for not using a preliminary? Uh, thread-based multiprocessing uh, for parallel query uh, as a preliminary stage, which would presumably be easier to implement. So maybe. I, I'm a bit skeptical about that. Like I feel that my, my first gut reaction is that if we don't go all the way, we're not going to get the benefits. But maybe there is something there. Like Maybe you could then use... Uh, like replace the dynamic shared memory we have with you know inter-thread communication, maybe. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. We'll see. That might be one way to do it. But I'm, I'm in general, I'm not very hopeful for like a hybrid model. Like I don't feel it's my gut feeling, but I don't think that will uh, probably doesn't feel like a good idea to me. But we'll see. Um, cool. Thank you. Thank you.